thanks very much. And uh, I appreciate your help with that. Um, and uh, you know, when Janet reached out about uh, this forum, I was I was actually really excited to to have the invite and to be a part of this discussion. You know, one of one of the things that uh, certainly uh, I've had the opportunity to be engaged with over the last really year uh, in an ongoing basis is is really what is it take to become a learning health system? And then some of you have even heard the words here. Uh, we've been focusing on what we've called learning while doing, which um, has been uh, a big part of the work we've done with COVID to say, okay, we all of us hit this pandemic with not really knowing what are the right things to work and what are the things that don't work. And how do we learn while we're trying to take care of patients uh, in, a, in a, frankly, a, a situation like we've never been in before. But it really uh, spawned me to put together this presentation that I'm, uh, I'm actually uh, pretty happy with as it relates to why, why is it been so hard for organizations to really become learning in nature? And where do we leverage our mutual relationships and passion for learning together? So I, I, I have this title, quality versus and research, you know, kind of making up my own words here. But if we went to the next slide, I think I'd, I would like to level set what uh, hopefully all of you know. Um, but I, it, it's, it's important to state um, because I think a lot of people have delusions at times about what really may be happening. So um, some of you will recognize the picture of the gentleman in this, in this uh, 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 slide is, is actually Tom Starzl. Dr. Starzl obviously was one of our key finding fathers of the world of transplant, but also one of those individuals who, you know, just forged into new territories that didn't exist. Um, but despite that, and despite the fact that that's been now over 30 some years ago, uh, we still know uh, that healthcare is falling short of what we can achieve. Uh, we are great. We're all great some of the time, but we are not great all the time. And the issue of, of, of lack of reliability of our healthcare systems continues to just amaze me, even having worked in the field now over 20 years. Um, we have way too many errors, but they occur as a result of bad or no systems. Um, and we are still struggling every day at times. I'll have a conversation with folks about how we need to strive towards zero and strive towards perfection. And, and they'll look at me like, well, that's not possible. Well, my gosh, we've been talking about this for such a long time. Why are we still having this divide? There also continues to be this massive variation in clinical practice. All of you see it in your own network. Um, what is the difference between what we might have called good rehabilitation care versus suboptimal or, frankly, uh, 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 rehabilitation care that actually would lead to um, uh, negative outcomes? We also still have high rates of inappropriate care where uh, we are not making the best decisions for, for, for patients and families about, is this something we should do for you? Um, unacceptable rates of preventative care, we know that there are so many gaps is particularly highlighted in the disparities conversations over the last year uh, that have been heightened here in the Americas about um, what are we doing uh, in managing healthcare disparities? We have this still striking inability to know what we know works. Um, and that has really led to uh, this uh, huge amount of waste, every single one of these points. So when, when you hear that, first of all, you can get depressed, right? <laughs> um, and you can say, oh, wow. Um, and what I remind people about this, this perspective when you begin a conversation like this is to say, you know, I'm first of all, I'm an optimist. So uh, I look at this as nothing but really opportunities to go to the next level. If we do look at where we were 20 years ago, we have made great progress. The, these slides are in no way are to reflect the progress that took us from uh, healthcare in the United States functioning consistently at 10 to the minus one performance to while we do have processes now and solutions and programs that get us closer to 10 to the minus three, 10 to the minus four, they're rare in nature, but we know it can happen. We also just know it's been at a pace that actually just feels like it's dragging on for many of us that were on uh, gen one relative to improvement. 
And uh, I don't know about the rest of you, but as I get a little bit older, I'm, I'm losing my sense of patience about why is it that we have this continued inability to know what we, to do what we know works. So with that, you know, I, I frame the conversation in this 20 year period. We know from Institute of Medicine, we know from so many other reports that we need to make these transitions from fragmented, autonomous, competitive, individual care to looking at this team-based program that puts the patient at the center of it and clearly also puts the patient's requests and uh, preferences at the center of it. And that we still also struggle with transparency. And one of the things that uh, I have respected about the field of rehabilitation medicine for such a long time has been that you are leaders in this space. You absolutely created the integrated team you absolutely thought about how am I going to get this patient back home? You've been so far ahead um, of some of those dialogues that now more than ever, we need your profession and your field's help to bring the rest of the organizations and the rest of the professions forward to understand what it really means um, and to be able to deliver those best results. And so in many ways, uh, part of what I have to share with you all today is, is things that I know you know and have practiced, but more importantly, uh, I think the role that the LEARN Network can play in helping others come forth uh, to embrace uh, what healthcare needs to be in the future and how healthcare needs to continue to transform itself into a learning health system is, is super important. And so uh, there's a couple rules uh, that I, uh, I, I start with in a little bit of, of also where we go forth. And so I have a few slides here that are so critical, but they seem to still be the founding base of where we need to, to work forward. So we all love good old Albert, right? Um, but there is wisdom needed as we still go into this learning health, uh, health system uh, uh, network. And that is uh, one of the most important things uh, everyone tends to forget. If I only had one hour to save the world, I'd spend 55 minutes solving, defining the problem and five minutes finding the solution. Um, when I think about learning health systems, it, this, this phrase is one that um, I feel that healthcare has, has failed quite a bit at at times. The actual healthcare delivery side constantly is jumping to answers, constantly jumping to answers without data. And at, at, in, the, in the research perspective that uh, so many of you as colleagues have, have uh, in, impassioned and driven forward, the issue of defining the problem and having good data to make the right decisions has been part of that mantra. But yet the sense of urgency addiction that existed in, exists in care delivery has, has, has kind of offset that. Well, no, we don't have time for that. We just need to go. How do we close that gap? Um, and, and a lot of it, I believe, begins in knowing the problem we're actually trying to solve and agreeing that it is the problem. The second part of it is, is so true um, also. And uh, Margaret Mead's one of my favorite. You know, what people say, what people do, and what people say they do are not the same thing. And when I think about the, the learning health system, Unfortunately, uh, there are still way too much problem and activity being solved in spaces where people think they know what's happening, people kind of understand what's happening, but we are still not figured out a way to bring that frontline voice to the, to the table without having people who are actually out there doing the work. And if we're going to be learning a learning health system and, and, and really impact that uh, the outcomes we're striving for, we actually must think differently about how we bring that face forward. And this, this last one is, is one, again, uh, I, I can't emphasize enough. I, I still see it day in and day out. We spend this enormous amount of time, whether it's conducting a clinical trial, uh, whether it's conducting a process change, whether it's it's, it's figuring out what problem we are solving. Um, there seems to be two perspectives. Um, we take way too long and we build a process. And at the end of six months, we think it's gonna work. 
and we've never really trusted it and tried it. And we also keep doing the same thing. I was just having a conversation earlier today about capacity. And uh, you know, the answer is, well, send an email to all the doctors and they'll understand we've got to get people discharged. And you kind of want to shake your head and you're like, yeah, they'll, they'll read their email three days from now. And is that really a strategy? But we still have that pervasive resistance to change that's out there. So these principles, these pieces of wisdom have to just keep driving this direction for being a, 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 a learning health system. So what is that to me? And what are those gaps? So keep going. So I think there's really actually three characteristics that um, are super important for us to really capitalize and become what I think we all want to see happen in healthcare. I believe we all have a lot of combined and aligned vision and belief that we need to focus, we need to manage innovation ideas, we need to do a full value capture, which is, says we've got to look at this clinically and financially, and then we have to move fast. And a, a, a learning health system would actually, if fully realized, optimize healthcare delivery we would not be taking uh, what may have been in the healthcare delivery side, short-sighted, urgency-addicted, poorly defined solutions and bringing them to the table. Nor would we take, uh, have the time to take what's been the traditional trajectory within some of the clinical research work that, and practical research and applicable research that needs to be done. We would figure out how to bring those worlds together. And it's in the bringing of those worlds together that we would learn how to do what we know works, which is something we know doesn't always happen now. So the, 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 the true system that comes together fuses, right? Fuses the world of care, which is imperfect as we know, and has so many gaps and research, which is intended to help us figure that out. The learning health system optimizes that and brings the two worlds together in this learning environment that allows us to implement change in ways that we've never done before. Because it's no longer my opinion versus Janet's opinion versus Rick's opinion versus Kate's opinion. It's here's good data, here's good process, here's what we need to do. And yet as we go to the next slide, uh, one of the things that, as I said, I've become, I've become a student in this space over uh, the last year, even more so than I was in the past. And by being a student and, and coming at this as much more of an operational person, right? I, I believe quality isn't a thing. Quality is embedded in everything we do. So I come at the world very deeply operationally. I took the opportunity to sit back and say, so what, what would really need to change? In the, in the infrastructure of an organization um, from its systems and its culture, if you really were going to merge the worlds, you were really gonna bring them together. And, and this, is, this is just that list. Um, this is my list. Uh, I, I uh, don't profess it to be uh, perfect. I don't profess it to be um, complete, uh, but hopefully a little provocative about uh, what it means because I would say one of the greatest challenges that exists within uh, healthcare delivery today is when we use the word learning health system, I don't really think most healthcare executives even understand what it means. And so you have to, as we do with many things, think about the practical changes that are necessary to move an organization from its current state to one that actually allows people to see that future state in a way that says, well, this is how work would be different, or this is how we would change it. So this is, the, uh, this is that list. Um, and I would believe over time, many of you on the phone could add to this, could uh, change this, and could think about how we actually begin to uh, manage some of the systems and cultural changes as a roadmap. So um, as, as you can see, uh, and I'm going to highlight a few of these as we go forward, I I don't want to waste our time on every single one of them because they're very probably clear, uh, but, uh, but some of them maybe are not. 
Um, so let's talk about adaptive clinical uh, trial design. Um, in most of the, uh, uh, of the academic medical centers, uh, the physicians in particularly, and I should, I should use the word physician um, and clinician broader here, so forgive me that that uh, didn't get corrected. I, I had made some, made some edits there. Folks don't really necessarily know how to do it. Um, they don't know how to have adaptive clinical trial designs. We, we still have a, a deep culture of RCTs. But again, this is where the rehab professional and the network that you all have formed, you know how to do this. You know how to make this real. And having that talent uh, across multiple departments who would come together in multidisciplinary studies, I think is part of that future state. Are our chairs, are our chiefs recruiting people and bringing people and empowering people at the table who know how to do that work? I would say the second thing that, that really becomes very confusing in the healthcare delivery world is, 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 uh, is this thought of you know, what I'll call multiple aligned and competing studies. Um, we all have thought provoking questions. We all have provocative ideas. And yet we don't really have a good solid governance process that would say, here's the priorities of the health system. These are the big problems we're trying to solve. And here's the priorities of our researchers. And how do we merge them so that we can all agree, these are the handful of topics that we're going to pursue. It doesn't mean you don't pursue others. It's, it's almost like, how do you start? How do you get this learning health system thing moving in a different way? It's by, yeah, keep doing what you're doing. The majority of researchers pose your questions, go through your processes. But if you wanna really transform and become learning together, in care delivery and in, in clinical findings, you're gonna to have to sacrifice and probably narrow the scope because we can't do it all, right? And it goes back to the same issue with the, an IRB process that has a very narrow interpretation of QI. I, I, I really believe that having, again, a fast track for a subset of projects that probably have IRB and QI approval at the same time is a new paradigm that some of us have perfected, some of us don't even talk about, some would maybe say what I just said was heresy. But the point is, is, is that there's not this pure divide that, um, at, that, ex that exists in the conversation. The last one on this page is really super important. You know, uh, our work in, uh, in clinical research in the past has been very uh, dependent upon some in-kind services. Um, and, and because uh, the, the, the uh, studies are nested and in this siloed kind of trial design, here's my rehab study, here's my neurosurgery study, here's my medicine study, picking up, you know, different topics. What happens is every single person then goes to the lab, and this is my, one of my best examples that we've just been through, uh, goes to the lab and says, I need remnants, I need bio samples. I need, can, can you get me these 10 patients, these samples? And what's happening on the operational side is healthcare is changing and boy, talk about dramatic changes right now with vacancies and turnover and people deciding if they wanna work in healthcare for the rest of their life or not. Um, these become, have become even more non-sustainable. The, the in-kind approach doesn't exist. And so along comes COVID, along comes, well, is it alpha, is it beta, is it delta? Uh, all of the specimen processing things that we need to do. Instead of every single study having kind of their piece of the lab process and looking for lab to make some of those things happen, what we have pivoted to say is, you know what, we're going to embed a person in our lab who's dedicated to move those specimens. Because you know who was doing it before? The senior director on a Sunday when they had a few hours, which doesn't help accelerate anyone's work. And it doesn't help accelerate any of our findings. And so when we think about these aligned initiatives that allow us to get enough of, a, of several studies together that all may have some of these common needs, lab, pharmacy, imaging, maybe e-record, e-record being a big one. 
what we think about then is how do they align and help us provide the infrastructure to accelerate the learning? What you begin to see though, are uh, through this slide and frankly, through even the next one, are that same kind of dialogue, current state. Well, we've got these consents and do we need to do consents? And is there a different way to do consents? Uh, liberalized and embedded um, and, uh, and, and thinking about what do we say from the beginning, right? And there are organizations across the United States that have really started to take this on differently and have worked uh, and are seeing huge enrollments in various clinical trials. Uh, however, uh, having said that, we also know that it's still something, again, in a small way, to begin to see change as a learning health system. Uh, adaptive learning and rapid publication. Um, we uh, have gone from standing up monoclonal antibody centers to doing the randomization to publishing the first information in 21 days. Um, it's a paradigm shift and it's very driven because of, uh, of the fact that we, really needed to get the information out there for people to clinically respond. But as you can see, it also requires not uh, starting from scratch. It talks about leveraging existing or modestly adapted resources and sharing some of that infrastructure like uh, research coordinators that we actually aggregated in a different way not have, this is mine, this is yours, this is someone else's. Is there a small pool that allows us to be able to accelerate change? Um, next slide. Same way, um, same way with uh, ongoing um, uh, discussions that, that this learning health system is embedded and that we actually are focusing on care delivery changes. And we have infrastructure in a writing team that actually helps us pull that together. And then we push those messages out. And we also have some shared core statistical support. So when, when I made this list, these were all the things that as an as, as a individual who focuses on implementation and accelerating implementation, thought, well, these are the things that have to change that any healthcare delivery executive could kind of get their head around, right? Oh. Yeah, we don't have anybody that writes. Oh, no, no. Or we don't necessarily make sure all of the work that we're doing is getting published and pushed out there. Um, no, I have my statistician who I prefer versus your statistician. Well, yeah, that's great. But like maybe there's a core group that helps us move again the projects that we agree are a priority. So next slide. Um, and so there has to be an integrated approach, right? Um, and, and that is making sure we establish this leadership uh, system uh, approach, which is whether it's hospitals or departments and the health sciences and others that come together and say, what really are we going to focus on initially? And how do we do that together? So that we are thinking about studies and outputs and how we're actually changing the culture of learning while doing as an organization. Next slide. Because the, the real goal of all of this at the end of the day is that it, this should drive us towards better policy and, and hopefully at the end of the day, not only better care, but better financial performance. Um, and the opportunities are nested. And, and I use that word um, uh, very thoughtfully because the easy low hanging fruit discussions are gone, which is why again, I think the rehab network brings together uh, the interdisciplinary professions to think about where are these items uh, in today's opportunities exist and how do we go about not only saying what the policy decisions should be relative to this, which will hopefully guide future funding and future studies, but also how does that help the healthcare delivery system that's ultimately trying to improve quality and manage costs be more effective? And that's why uh, I believe some of the practical discussions uh, that we, I've laid out in this PowerPoint allow us to think that way. So next slide. And, and this is just a little reminder 
of, of all that all those nested opportunities. And what what people forget uh, a lot of times are, you know, the, the the savings left in efficiency is pretty small. We have to really go after these tougher case utilization issues and tougher case rate utilization issues, which are are really the things that um, that are driving healthcare to not achieving its high outcomes. I, I use the efficiency bucket uh, as, a, as an example of, you know, the boss showed up and said, you have to cut your budget 5%. Well, that's probably the easiest way to do it. But if you really want to set in sustainable change in a learning manner, you've got to think about the multi-professional uh, approach uh, to be able to target uh, changes in these areas. And so next slide. And, and as we all know, uh, clinical and quality improvement it, it isn't free, um, but it has a massive return on investment. And that's where using some of the policy and funding dollars that are out there to go after learning health system initiatives that are aligned, that have come together up front, who a group of, of of clinical experts and clinical researchers have come together and said, this is what we need to do. And this is what we need to be successful. And having that input on day one, frankly, allows us to, to I think, transform to new levels where the investment is being utilized appropriately to allow the care delivery to change. And, and that is part of what this is about because the next slide, is really the part that I want to end with. We, uh, you know, are, are in such a point. Uh, healthcare is never going to be the same. Never going to be the same after what we've been through in the last eighteen months, uh, twenty months now. It is not uh, returning. And what we have seen more than ever is that we have to go forward connecting the mind and, and, and heart of healthcare staff, whether that be healthcare researchers like many of you, healthcare teams, healthcare staff, uh, the world will not uh, come forward in the way that it has been. And this era is gonna cause us to have to think about this courage to change. And it's hard, uh, we're all pretty comfortable with where we are uh, and have been. And now we all feel this sense of uneasiness uh, and the uneasiness is how are we gonna get through this period and come out the other end when we're seeing massive resignations, so many people leaving the field, we're trying to keep them engaged, trying to keep them motivated. We have to bring them to the table together in the beginning. And that really is um, the courage that all of us need going forward to be able to adapt uh, and to be able to think about it differently. Because you know, last slide, when you get down to it, uh, this is one of my favorite, better has no limit. Uh, I'd like to believe that we would come forth from this period of time, leveraging the learnings from the pandemic, leveraging the importance of the team at the bedside, being engaged and driving what really a learning health system can accomplish by aligning, even in the beginning, a handful of goals and projects and priorities that allow us to be different. And so uh, that's that. 